Hey, this is Mick Jones of Foreigner, and you're listening to Pantheon Podcast. Hey, I'm Nick DiMatteo, and welcome to Season 5, Episode 41 of Music is Not a Genre. Kind of monumental because I've never done 41 episodes in a season, and it's monumental for another reason, because this is uh, the start of a brand new series, which I'll get into in a second. Thank you, as always, for watching and listening. Please uh, take a moment to support this podcast at patreon.com slash music is not a genre. Go also to youtube.com slash at music is not a genre. Subscribe there. It's free as always. Uh, like and share and comment. I'd love to hear your comments. My website is nickdomatio.com where you get this uh, podcast, my music and all everything else. And then as always, please uh, listen to and support my band Rec at recarry.bandcamp.com. So as I said uh, today, this week, very special because I'm starting a new series that uh, I'm tentatively calling Back Talk because it's not an interview. It may look like an interview. For those of you just listening, I have Steve Erickson on camera here and he will be my guest today instead of me running off at the mouth about a subject on my own i've decided to bring someone in who's knowledgeable about a topic something that we can riff on together and explore and this is the first in this series uh hopefully it'll go well enough that we'll do it again uh with steve and with other people this week's topic the first topic for this is south african music uh, we're going to do our best to unravel that. How are you doing today, Steve? Uh, pretty good. How are you? Good. Not bad. Like you said, we kind of wish it was a little bit cooler out there, but, you know, we're making it work. So today, as I said, we're talking about uh, South African music. I think the first question I'd like to start with, because we did discuss this, is why aren't we just doing this episode on quote unquote world or global music as a whole? Well, I think uh, the con the concept of world music, that's a term that's gone out of fashion lately. I think its flaws have become very glaring, but it's often just been replaced by global music. I think, for instance, I think the Grammys now have a category for global music, but it's People from, if you look at the, the nominees from last year, it's like people from five different countries. It, if you look at, the Bill, Billboard still has a world music chart. I looked at it a few weeks ago and it was entirely K-pop. It, mm. it seems to me like there, there's often, that, that makes about as much sense as saying that Brit British hip hop is world music because it sounds different in American hip hop, it's coming from a somewhat different perspective, but it's in the English language, so it's seen as being part of the same genre. Whereas if the lyrics, if it was coming from like Africa or the Middle East, it wouldn't necessarily be, be seen that way. So the, and also Africa is just a huge continent that encompasses so many cultures, even, even within individual countries for instance there there are 11 languages spoken in south africa uh two of them are kind of colonial impositions being afrikaans and english mm -hmm. but there are nine you know indigenous languages as as well so there are for instance people people also say latin music but if you look at um for instance, the two most popular artists to come out of Brazil are Astro Gilberto and Sepultura. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that really shows the, the, the rage. You know how they sound nothing alike. And because Sepultura sang in English and were a, a metal band, even though they were, uh, they were Brazilian, most people wouldn't consider that, wouldn't call that Latin music, but it is. I know. That's great. Yeah, go ahead. Latin music has been made by by Puerto Ricans or Latinos living within the U.S. Even, but because you know, Bad Bunny has not. Um, he's released, I think, five albums at this point, and there's maybe 
only one or two sentences in English, but he's Puerto Rican, so he's an American, an American citizen. Yep. Um, but so saying African music, there are all kinds of different styles. Like there's what's called a desert desert blues scene around um, the northwest of Africa in countries like Niger, with artists like. Uh, Madhu Mokhtar and Tinarawen, who are basically, they're basically playing blues-based rock. It sounds somewhat different because their their guitars are, they're playing quarter tones, like they're playing a, a different, they're not using the 12-tone scale. But they've also, like Mokhtar recites ZZ Top as one of his biggest influences. And he, he acted in a remake of Purple Rain. So the, the idea that Africa, also the idea that Africa exists in this uh, I- isolation chamber where people aren't influenced by what's going on in the in the pop or rock or hip hop in the U.S. and Europe is is not true at all. So it seems like even just focusing on South Africa, you you know you could do a season of podcasts about the various genres. It, Popular music there is a history going back to the 19, 1930s. Yeah, I yeah, I, and I think the two things that brings up is one, we do kind of lump together music from a certain language or continent as all one. For example, uh, I know that when I was a kid, if I if I you know knew of somebody like you know Fela Kuti. I thought, oh, that's that's African music, and it is, but it's but he was from Nigeria, which has a different has different traditions, although many of them overlap than South Africa. And the, just like any country, it's going to have different flavors and and ways that things are structured and produced that that can't be lumped together like that. And and then when you think of South Africa itself, and I just did kind of a cursory, you know, look at what styles that have been there that have been prominent at some point in their last, you know, 90, 100 year history. And you have gospel and classical and uh, an African style and acapella, which is huge. And penny whistle jive, which is often when we think of certain types of quote unquote traditional uh, South African music, we hear that kind. It's now known as Quela. But then when you get into soul and jazz and and punk and disco and rock and alt and goth and pop and reggae and, and all of these the first thing that a lot of listeners and viewers might think of is, well, what's what's the difference? You hear all of those genres coming out of the United States and English speaking countries and other countries around the world and metal and techno, including I'm a piano, which you mentioned, and hip hop. The, and the point is something that you pointed out in your notes, which is there a we can't we can't uh, reduce a country's music to just one sound because that's because no country has just one sound whether you're talking about the most popular or or anything below that and b almost every probably every country but almost every country that has you know uh, music that's distributed and recording technology and all of that has as diverse an array of styles of music as we do here in the states yeah so uh- I don't know if people in Nigeria would lump together like uh, country and heavy metal and call it American music, but that's kind of the equivalent of what what happens with uh, just labeling a whole continent a whole continent as though it had one style of music. I completely agree. Yeah, and and uh, that's I think part of what we're going to try to get into here is to you know. It's, we're focusing somewhat on the popular music, which I think is is good and important because it's like you said, there's a continuity between our our continents and our countries in that from the very beginning, South African popular music borrowed from U.S. music. And as the years went on and decades went on, U.S. music borrowed from South African music. Yeah, um, actually... The the penny whistle has been very important in South African music, but it was brought there by British colonialists. Hmm. The penny whistle also pops up 
in uh, like Scottish folk music or Irish folk music, the the Pope's used to frequently. And the in a lot of ways, you can say South African popular music starts with Solomon Linda's song. In I know I'm going to mangle the pronunciation. In Blue Day, um, um, do day, yeah, do day, yeah. We send a cappella vo- vocal harmony song, but that that style of vocal harmonies was introduced to South Africa by Anglican missionaries uh, from from the UK. Uh, but hmm. in a is not sung in English, but it found this kind of winding road to to becoming a hit in um, ar- around the world, although not in the original version. If you listen to the song, there's this chant, a wee ma way, a wee ma way, and that got turned into Pete Seeger's group, The Weavers, in the 1950s. Performed, performed it as a wim away, and then the duo group, the Tokens, uh, in 1961, kind of rewrote the song into the Lion Sleeps Tonight, which was a much, a much bigger hit, and from there it, uh, it, uh, there are probably hundred. I doing research for this, I found an EP of cover versions of by, of the Lion Sleeps Tonight by South African artists. Including mm. biggest names like Lady Smith, Black Mombasa. Wow. But Solomon Linda got very little publishing. Uh, he really got screwed over in terms of publishing royalties. Even by 1950s or 1960s dollars, he should have earned millions in, uh, in publishing royalties. And he earned maybe like one percent from from the lion sleeps to look tonight yeah it's what what comes to mind when i hear that is you know we tend to think of certain kinds of music from other countries as let's say indigenous music and because it has a, such a, a different sound to our ears that we think oh that's just their traditional music and as and if anybody anybody who knows anything about the music industry, there are songs that are either so that are so old or so steeped in tradition that they have either always been or reverted to what's called the public domain, meaning no one has to pay royalties to, about uh, you know to any of those songs. And we tend to lump together songs that have that sound to them as oh that must just be some you know, traditional uh, public domain song that everyone sang, you know, in the in in their groups in South Africa. So we can just take that. That's no big deal. Not checking the fact that there's this dude who's just like any other singer songwriter from any other country who put this song together, created it and wanted to disseminate it and market it and make money from it. And it's a convenient way for, you know, those people to use songs like that and and say oh i didn't know and then oh we then we don't have to pay royalties until somebody finally steps up and says you owe this person money yeah unfortunately there's a history of white artists going to using south african music and other forms of african and african-american music without without payment or or crediting the artists like i know if i tried out the phrase called cultural appropriation, some of your listeners are probably going to instantly tune out. And a lot of the, the times it, it's used are sometimes very petty or can even have this kind of segregationist undertone. But there's a real history. For instance, Serge Gonsberg on his 1965 album Percussions sampled both the Nigerian drummer Ola Tunji and the South African singer Miriam Makiba without uh, giving them credit, permission, asking for permission or paying paying them. And then Malcolm McLaren, the uh, the Sex Pistols manager, he released an album in 1982, Duck Rock, which was it, was, it was kind of one of the first albums that went from rock, someone who had a background in rock music recording music around the world. He went to 
there's some old school hip hop on it, like Buffalo, Buffalo Gals is a really well known, well known song. Uh, he recorded several songs, you know, with this hip hop group called the World's Famous Supreme Team. But he also went to Colombia and South Africa. And the first time I heard the album, I found, I found it bizarre because he adds very little to those songs. He's not really a singer. Um, so there are these songs that sound are obviously uh, African musicians who who aren't credited. It, their names their names don't appear. They don't get. Uh, they're not listed on the uh, the official song songwriting credits. Uh, there were two groups he worked with. Why uh, there was a band I think called the Boyoyo Boys that he he both worked with them and played plagiarized their song. So there's a there's a good reason why people are suspicious of white artists drawing from drawing inspiration from other culture. Yeah, because it's happened since forever and. I, I always found Malcolm McLaren interesting because it, people don't know he basically put together the Sex Pistols and it was as though he he was more of a businessman and, and kind of a, you know, a showman and huckster than anything else. And he did have a love for music, but how he used that was he would find the thing that he thought was the next big thing and put it together any way he knew how, uh, good or, you know, good or ill which is how he got from, you know, punk to, you know, Buffalo gals in just a few years without much consideration about the musicianship or the musicians doing it or anything like that. And that's, yeah, that's unfortunately a tradition of colonialist countries, including ours. Yeah. He also played a role in, in introducing African rhythms to rock music. The band Bow Wow Wow, that he managed after the Sex Pistols. The, I think they were originally Adam Ant's backing band and mm. McLaren persuaded them to leave Adam and join up with this uh, teenage, teenage girl, Annabella Lewin. And he, there, there was a, there's an album on Nonsuch. I, I'm not sure the name of it, but there's a song from, of drumming from, from the country of Burundi, which is really... It's been sampled all over the place, um, but the beat from that was the was basically the beat that Adam and the Ants and Bow Wow Wow used. Uh, wow. Okay, so if someone heard it, they probably recognize it. Yeah, they they didn't sample it. They played they played variations on it. Okay, I got gotcha. you. Yeah, I found it interesting. I was kind of doing a little research, and you know about like you said, starting in the 1930s and all of that. And it reminded me how even from from the, you know, almost the beginnings of jazz, you would hear African influence and the a lot of a lot of jazz, of course, African-Americans and all of that. So there was something within the, the DNA already. But then you go to people like, you know, Duke Ellington or Count Basie or some of the other big band, you know, uh, people and composers who would have that, you know, for want of a better phrase, they what they would call jungle drum sound, where, you know, like uh, the song, I forget the name of the song. Uh, and that was the American version of what they heard of as African music. And that continued through the decades for, with people like Pete Seeger and, you know, The Lion Sleeps Tonight and, you know, you finally have African uh, stars, South African in particular, coming over and making uh, some splash in the 60s and 70s and all of that. I remember in the 80s, you know, and even even before Graceland, when you had people like David Bowie and Gabriel, Peter Gabriel, in, in you know, integrating some of that sound into what they were doing. And then, you know, you say, bow, wow, wow. And then I think of something as pop as, you know, Michael Jackson or Lionel Richie, where they had those that chanting sections in some of their songs, which were African or African influenced. And and that leads to Graceland and all and all of that. And so it's been this tradition of cherry picking sounds from from Africa and South Africa 
to create more quote unquote exotic sounds in American music. Yeah, at the same time, there's been a bit Afrobeats in the last two years has really soared in popularity in the US. The number three single right now is the Nigerian singer Rima's song Calm Down. It's one of the biggest hits of the last year, but until 2021, no artist from Nigeria had ever made the Billboard Top 100. Mm-hmm. However, I was surprised how much that South African music was actually pretty popular in the U.S. in the um, in the 1950s and 60s. Like the fir- the first South African artist to hit the Billboard Hot 100 was in 1956. We, if we think of Graceland as the starting point of what, this pop popularization of world music. Well, the first South African artist to have it in American Hit was 30 years before that album came out. That's incredible. That was the group, the, the Manhattan Brothers with Lo- song Lovely Linda. And they included Miriam Makiba, who went solo shortly afterwards. She released her first solo album in 1960. She had a, a big hit in the U.S., in 1967 with the song Pata Pata. And then the trumpet player Hugh Masakela got to number one in the US with, uh, in 1968 with Grazing in the Grass. I love that song. And I think he was a part of the, uh, if anyone's seen Summer of Soul, I believe he performed there. And it was such a huge hit at the time. And that was, that was like, yeah, that was the period where It wasn't just Americans, uh, you know, translating South African music that that there was they would come to this country and try to make a name and make a career. And those were two, you know, Makiba and Yumasa Kaler, two huge, you know, stars in the kind of jazz funk field. And Afro pop. Yeah. And uh, just to note, I looked up the Manhattan Brothers and I believe that song was called Lovely Lies. Oh, yeah, which that's fine, but that that surprised me that that was uh, a Billboard hit in the 1950s, and I listened to it, and I was like, "This is doo wop." Yeah, I can hear a lot of doo wop in um, South African acapella music, although Lady Lady Smith Black Mombasa built their entire their entire career on on acapella music. They didn't re- release an album with any other instruments until 1990, but they have a, the fact that they had ten members. There's there's a different there's a different sense of harmony and rhythm uh, than you would get in duop. But I think the 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 songs that Paul Simon performed with them on Graceland seem to be real pretty obviously referencing duop. Like the intro to uh, "Diamonds on the Soles of, of Her Shoes," and then all this, it's it's kind of obvious that he could recognize the similarities, and he was thinking back to music from when he was American music from when he was was much younger, and uh, and seeing the resemblance. That's what's always fascinated me about uh, African artists from at least from the nineteen eighties. I don't have much memory prior to that, uh, but that that their a cappella music was so strikingly similar to um, American a cappella groups, you know, whether it was sung in English or or not. And when you talk about and when you brought up the point that African and and uh, South African and American music have kind of crossed currents from the beginning of popular music, you know, recorded popular music, it makes more sense that you have somebody like, you know, the Manhattan Brothers putting an ear to the ground of what was going on in the in the States and singing this song in English and then creating a song that you wouldn't even know that it came from South Africa back then if you were just listening, oh, that's a that's just a doo-wop song. And then you have American artists like you know, Paul Simon and, and every single doo-wop group, really, or anybody who was doing those kinds of harmonies, whether it was a cappella or not, you know, uh, putting an ear to the ground for South African music and saying, this is something that, you know, we really 
want to integrate. And it, to me, it's the acapella and certain types of rhythms that have infiltrated music in our country for decades and really helped to shape our own music. Um, even the Beach Boys had an intersection with South African music. Really? They, um, in 1970, they started their own label, uh, Brother Records, and they signed a South African band called The Flames. The Flames didn't have that much success in the U.S., but then in 1972, the, Brian Wilson had basically dropped out of the Beach Boys, and the group was kind of splintering. And they, they added two members of the Flames to the, as full members of the Beach Boys. That only lasted for two years. I think huh. there were only maybe two or three albums that they perform on. But one of them, Blondie Chaplin, does a lot of the lead vocals around on like the Beach Boys, Holland, and Carl and the Passions. Oh, yeah. I remember those. Wow, I had no idea the Beach Boys had anything to do with African music. <laughs> Now, yeah, around that time as well, you made a note here before we started, uh, and we're going to get a little bit more into this in the second half of the of the talk. But uh, the you believe that the first, I think, protest song by an American was Gil Scott Heron's Johannesburg in 1975. Is that right? Uh, yeah, Mary Mary Makiba uh, actually moved to the U.S. out of necessity because she was. She was, she was barred. Her, her mother died in 1960, and the South African government would not even let her come back to the country to attend her mother's funeral. Mm. So she was, she, she wound up moving to the U.S., which at the time was not that different from, so Jim Crow was basically our version of apartheid. Yeah. And she became more politicized over the course of the 60s. She spoke out against apartheid at the UN in 1968. She, she, she was recording protest songs by the late 60s and kind of, she, that wound up kind of taking, taking her career in the US. And she, she also got involved with the Black Panthers and Stokely Carmichael. Mm -hmm. And she, she was back to, uh, moved back to Africa in the, by, by the seventies, although she still couldn't, she couldn't travel to South Africa. In it, and when I think of, of of her and the the how the politics intersected with the music and all that, and of course a lot of that was happening in different ways in other types of music. What comes to mind again, just knowing a little bit about her music, is how much uh, Nina Simone's music changed from the kind of just soul, you know, relatively standard soul it, with jazz tinges. And then you see in the late sixties and early seventies, how political she gets. And you can hear in some of what she does that influence both on, from the political side and from the music side. Yeah. Even she, she was married to Masakela for several years and they remained friends and collaborators. Ma Masa Kill's music got more adventurous in the 70s. It, there, it's much more, Racing in the Grass is a great song, but it's very, it, if you hear it now, like the opening cowbells, you, I, I, I'm, sure, I'm sure that's been sampled on probably dozens of hip hop songs. <laughs> I'm, it was seen as kind of easy listening. Yeah. Jazz pop. His music got, got more or less, have identifiably South African and, and funkier, maybe closer to like seven like jazz fusion in the uh in the early 70s. And there was so much of that then too. You you would hear it from, you know, bands like Weather Report and and all where you where this type of expansive sound was starting to shape jazz in the in the late 60s and especially in the 70s in ways that it hadn't before. Yeah, and I think there, most of the most of Weather Report's lineups, every, every member was from a different country. Oh. And at least until both Jaco Pistorius and Wayne Shorter were in the group, but they had like, you, you know, Joe Zavano was Austrian, oh. uh, 
I think the original drummer was Brazilian. Um, the original bass player was Czech. Huh. I had no idea. That's so uh, cool. So we were talking a little bit about the 70s and, uh, you know, the Gil Scott Heron song. And that brings to mind how over the ensuing decade, decade and a half, our awareness of what was going on in South Africa uh, increased to a, a greater degree. We were more aware in this country of apartheid and what was going on. And there were, you know, people in, in politics and in, in art protesting against and trying to make that change, which we know eventually, you know, did did do something. And you had songs like uh, there was a, this guy, Jeffrey Osborne, did a song called Soweto, which for some reason has always stuck in my head. And then we were talking about that song that was sort of like another super group. We are the world, you know, USA for Africa, uh, Sun City in the 80s to raise money and awareness for apartheid. Yeah, um, Stevie Wonder also did an anti-apartheid song. There was Peter Gabriel's Vigo. Unfortunately, right. I think Sun City was a better idea that, than a song. Having something like 30 different singers singing and, and even rapping over the same production just didn't work for everybody's styles. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I, I think there's a nostalgia factor when I hear it now where I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember that song. But I also remember at the time thinking, I, I love that they're doing this, but it's not a song that I'm going to be, you know, spinning at a party and not because of the content, but, but just because it didn't quite hold together as a song. Yeah, it also wasn't that successful as it at, at raising money for charity. It, I, I think the lyrics have aged better than We Are the World. Or certainly, do you know it's Christmas? <laughs> yes. But, but the fact that it explicitly attacks Reagan meant that uh, American radio barely played it. it. The song barely hit the top 40. I think it peaked at number 38. So it, it raised a million dollars for anti-apartheid organizations, w which is certainly nothing to sneeze at. But compared to the amount that it could have raised if it were pop as popular as We Are the World, um, you know, that, that would be exponentially higher, probably. Uh, okay. Yeah, I wondered that. I hadn't looked up how much money it raised or how successful it was. Yeah. But I, and I guess I can't remember, and I didn't look this up, you know, but since we often talk about politics and social issues on this podcast, do you have an idea of when, uh, I can't, I just can't remember when apartheid wound down, when it finally was, you know, uh, done away with was that the 90s or 2000s it was, it was the early two, it was the early 90s uh, i'm what? not sure about the exact year i i should have looked that up i think it may have been 1994 okay but we, we were talking about this earlier but i was a college student from 1988 to 1992 and it felt like the two biggest pol political issues that americans were aware of were the kind of winding down of communism and the Cold War and South Africa and apartheid. And I think that music played a big role, particularly after the success of Graceland and making it feel like South Africa was at was at the heart of of the of the you know the modern world at that point. Yeah, I fully agree. I think there was that period, you know, where the biggest issue in the in the early 80s was AIDS and the, you know, the shit that the Reagan administration pulled and, and how difficult it was to get uh, our cultures and the entire world through that hardship. And that has, you know, was, was a real issue for way beyond that, but it was more prominent in the early eighties. And then you, you know, you started to see more awareness. Well, we, we all knew when, especially when Gorbachev took power, that something was happening there and that the, you know, the wall would come down and all that stuff. And, and, and things were winding down it, for, for some reason, I recently saw a movie about uh, the game Tetris and there was a lot of talk about the wall coming down and all the stuff that was happening there because Tetris came over from Russia before the wall came down, but right about when Gorbachev was starting to rise to power and, and, that is a memory from my 20s as well of thinking 
there's there's that there's communism and there's apartheid and those were the big social causes and you're right you saw so many artists playing their concert in russia you know whether it was paul mccartney or billy joel or whoever else and then you had so many other artists making music about south africa or trying to work with people from south africa it seems so like by the 90s south africa fell off the radar very quickly I actually, I've been trying to think about the last time I read a news article about about South Africa in The Guardian or The New York Times, and I absolutely cannot think of, of it or what it was. The country still has very serious problems, like sky-high rates of HIV and AIDS. Uh, there's still, most of the wealth is still in the hands of white people. It has a huge problem with violent crime. But Americans kind of stopped paying attention to it once apartheid ended. And, and that, that, oh, that was also reflected in music. There, it was like, quote unquote, world music was kind of a fad in the 80s. And then it, in the 90s, people stopped. Uh, it, 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 I think it always had kind of a dedicated audience, particularly through things like the WOMAD festival that Peter Gabriel set up. And he, he started a record label called Real World. And David Burns started a label, Luwaka Bob, that released a lot of music from Latin America. But as, as something that, uh, it, 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 it had a small niche audience. And honestly, that niche audience was kind of considered uncool if you were like, if you were a rock fan, for the most part in the 90s. Like if your favorite band, it, if you're into indie rock in the 90s, you probably thought Graceland was laughable. I, like that, that was my opinion at the time. I've come to think it's recognized that it's a great album. But uh, yeah, it seems like there's been a, within the past 10 years, particularly with Emma Piano, there's been a revival of interest around the world. Like not seeing it as quote unquote world music, but another, another genre of dance music. I love that you say that. And I, and I do remember it kind of falling off the face of the earth in terms of pop culture and how in the nineties, if you were still into what we would call world music, uh, the, you were probably kind of a neo hippie, you know, like, yeah. That. yeah and, and then that it really diminished and, and kept into its niche, you know, niches, for quite a while. And it's like you said, in the last 10, 15 years or so, it's it's kind of slowly crept up to the point where in the last five years, there's been a real dominance of, well, of course, uh, music from, um, you know, Spanish speaking countries and K-pop, but I'm seeing a lot more from South Africa and other countries and Africa. And I did an episode of uh, earlier this season, which I called the decade slam. And I was purporting to say, when some with all the major genres, when did they actually have their peak? You know, in both uh, commercialism and creativity and 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 critical acclaim and all of this stuff. And so, and uh, you know, like rock had its peak in the whatever 60s, 70s. I can't remember what I said, but I said for the twenties, too early to tell. But it's looking like this is finally when global music, music from other countries, isn't going to be just a fad or this kitschy kind of novelty thing, but it's actually making serious inroads into the fabric of American culture and the American, you know, uh, uh, pop uh, charts and all of that, Ev you know, evidenced by so many of the artists we know, you know, Bad Bunny and I mean, BTS and any anybody like that. And, and then, you know, lesser artists or artists that may other people might not know, and then you mentioned a while back that the number three song in the charts is, is a South African song. Is that right? Ni Nigerian. Nigerian. Although wow. it, it it didn't fully take off as a hit till till a remix with Selena Gomez came out. Okay. And that that song though is possibly the the most popular Afrobeat song ever in in the U.S. The second most popular was Essence, a duet by the singers. Uh, was Kid and Thames, but again, that didn't fully take off till a Justin Bieber remix was released. Okay, but I think so. I think a lot of a lot of the attention that's been paid to 
African music in the last decade. It's definitely benefited from North American, North American artists picking up on it and trying to participate in it. I think it's been when when black artists have have done it, it's been a bit. They've been much better about giving credit to the original artists yeah. and doing it in a more equitable way. Like there were several South African artists on the Black Panther soundtrack that Kendrick Lamar put together. Mm. The the rapper You Can Black Rock is featured on a song with the American rapper Vince Staples on that. And the the rapper Babes Wad- Wad- Wadamo, not, again, I'm probably mispronouncing her name, mm-hmm. but she's she has a style that mixes Jacome and hip hop where she, where she's just rapping over Jacome beats. She's also featured on that. And on the soundtrack that Beyonce did for the Lion King remake, she, she did the same concept that Kendrick did for the black Panther soundtrack, but she included even far more African artists. There's one song on that I included in the playlist that, that accompany, will accompany this yes. that's, that samples the Jacom song and she sings on it the American rapper Tierra Wack does but so do uh, several South, South African artists and Drake has worked with the South African producer Black Coffee who was one of the the big uh, the main artist in the Quedo genre which started in the 90s it was frequently called South Africa's answer to hip hop. Hmm. So, so, um, but if you listen to it now, there's a lot of hip hop in it, but there's also a lot of R and B, house music, yeah, dance hall. It to me, it sounds more derivative than the than the South African music that it would that it would wind up inspiring. But the singer Brenda Fossey uh, came out of that scene. She was really she made a lot of really excellent music um but it was um then Cueto led into ama piano and chacom yeah and i i mean i'm getting and i'm glad we did this episode because i'm getting more and more fascinated by the variety you know and just a quick note that we talk a lot about appropriation and and yet, and that's been more true than not, and especially historically, but there's been a lot of amalgamation and integration. And there have been artists through the decades who have supported, you know, more than adequately, uh, you know, and and in the way that you're talking about remixes by Justin Bieber and helping to highlight and bring to the fore artists from other countries that wouldn't make an inroad here unless they had a name, an American name attached to it. Uh, Harry Belafonte did that in the early '60s with 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 Hugh Masekela and and Miriam Makiba, and he's somebody who we know was a political activist and who would you know always be fair and 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 all of that. It it certainly didn't start a trend. I mean, most people were you know taking advantage of the music and the people uh, you know at that time, but to to have these names in South Africa attached to bigger names here in the states. And for people to like the music on, you know, on as it is, to me, means that there's going to be more traction for that music itself. And that if, you know, people are going to start discovering those artists more on their own, if record companies from this country start to sign those people to their to American deals. Well, so the rise of streaming as well as YouTube and Bandcamp also played a big role in this because there were, there are labels that are based in South Africa who stream their music all over the world on Apple and Spotify. Like if if people want to check out Emma piano, I would recommend looking up the releases of the label piano hub, which is uh, it's not on Bandcamp. They're distributed in South Africa by Sony, but you can find their music on um, on American streaming services, and you can find even on as far as things that are not official releases like DJ DJ mix tapes. If you search Emma Piano Mix on YouTube, you'll 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 hit a pretty big rabbit hole. 
or you can even see like that producer I mentioned, Black Coffee. Mm-hmm. You can see videos of him DJing uh, all, all over YouTube. And the first, the first time I heard Jacome was in 2017. I heard the producer Domino Wee. He, he released his debut album then. It was actually on an Italian label. That was called mm-hmm. Jacome O, which was it was founded by an Italian man who was really. Uh, passionate about about the genre. Their first release was a compilation called This Is Jacome, but I could go to Bandcamp and download that. Mm. If, if it were an import, uh, I know in the um, in the 80s, I never saw imports pressed in Africa. They never made it to, to the record stores that I went to. I would see things like the Instructable Beat of Soweto compilation yeah. Uh there was there was actually a brief period around the early eighties be- before Graceland where it felt like like Bob Marley had died. Um Island Records quickly signed King Sunny a day afterwards. And there was also um, you know, reggae had been popular in the punk scene and the post punk scene. And there was starting to, an interest in African music, uh starting starting to develop. There's a compilation called Zulu Jive, but I think it's music from the early 80s that's okay. very rough, guitar-based. There was a band from Zimbabwe called the, the Bundu Boys, who strangely, their guitar, the guitar playing sounds an awful lot like the Smiths. I, I'm actually, I'm pretty convinced Johnny Marr was listening to, to allow this music around, mm-hmm. around the time mm-hmm. the Smiths' first album mm. came out. You can hear a lot of similar, similar, uh, uh, you know, like methods of playing rhythm guitar. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. The way. Then, yeah. Go ahead. I I think unfortunately, the music when the music found an international audience, it got slicker and more compromised. For instance, the fir- the first album were Lady Smith, Black and Bazo. Uh, they released an album in 1990 called Two Worlds, One Heart, that where they used synthesizers and collaborated with George Clinton and started singing in English at times. And it's a pretty good album, but it, you can tell you can, you can tell the music was starting to get watered down to try to reach an international audience. In particular, they benefited greatly from working with Paul Simon. Graceland basically got them an international deal with Warner Brothers and, and and an audience around the world. But there was a, like, like I was saying, the earlier music was almost, some of it was almost like an African version of punk or, um, and that God, that was not the music that became popular after, uh, you know, in the U- African music that became popular in the U S after, after Graceland. Um, yeah. Yeah, I I think that in this country we either need the music to have this distinctive style of its country, like we talked about before. Oh, that's what that music sounds like, and then it becomes oh wow, I've discovered something interesting. Or it needs to be packaged and produced in a way that's palatable to to us, like yeah. the Lady Smith Black Mombazo album, or or in a different way, like the remixes that we have today. Yeah. Um, there still haven't been any full. No, I don't think any Emma Piano or Jacom songs have made the the Billboard Hot 100. It, M, Emma Piano is much mellower. The, they both came out came out of Durban around the same time, like the mid 2000s. But okay. Jacom is really is really kind of harsh and and grim music in a lot of ways. There's usually one one synthesizer chord. And and layers of fairly complex percussion over that. Whereas Emma Piano is almost the flip side, where the songs are very sunny, and hmm. they're both of that. Neither of them are all that melodic, actually. If there's like there's there's an emphasis on piano chords, which are usually influenced by jazz in Emma Piano, hmm. and, but the melody isn't really coming from the piano. It, but they, 
There's also a tense scene, I'm a piano. The average song is about seven minutes long. There are a lot of albums that run as long as two and a half hours. Whoa. I researching this, I was never able to find why why that why that's the case. A lot of the music, and especially in the 2010s, was was kind of handed around on on WhatsApp, and producers would would instead of instead of paying radio stations or Spotify playlists to promote their music, they would pay cab drivers to 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 play it in their in their taxis. Wow! In the hope oh. that their you know their passengers would hear the music and like it and yeah. uh, and pick up on pick up on them. Oh, that's clever. It's like a grassroots, you know, payola kind of. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I I think you're yeah, I I, I think it's going to be interesting seeing where all of this goes. You know, I, I I browse through your playlists and listen to almost all of the songs. And uh, I am going to put that list in some form here for everybody. Uh, if I have time before this is released. I will even create, let's say, a YouTube playlist from it so that it will be easier for people to get. And you mentioned some uh, compilations and things. And so we'll have all that. But I want to say off the bat that from my cursory listen to all the songs, there there's a lot of electronic music in, you know, as there is here in the States. There, not all of it is. There's some organic instruments and all of that. And I like the diversity and my favorite tracks so far, what I've heard are um, Show Mad- Majosi's John Cena, uh, Des- Desire, Maria Be Free, and I may be mispronouncing too, um, Mellow and Sleazy and T-Man Express's Vin Diesel. They all have somewhat different sounds. The last two are a little bit closer to each other, but I, I think that, and I do have maybe more diverse tastes than the average American listener possibly but I feel like a lot of what I've heard, you know, is first of all, you did, you did put, the playlist had a lot of collaborations with people. You mentioned a few of them like Tierra Whack and Beyonce and all of that, but even the ones that are just strictly only, uh, you know, South African artists sound like they are from that country. Like they're an interpretation of things that are happening in that country and our country and whatever it's got its own flavor, but it's not, overproduced and slickly polished to the point where it has become Americanized. And yet the sound to me sounds like it's something that could actually fly here as far as popularity. Uh, yeah, I think house music, particularly deep, deep in, I think deep house music is a specific genre, not just a term. There's a kind of house music that has really soulful vocals, a big R and B influence. That that really fed into Emma Piano. I can also hear a lot of kind of quiet storm R and B in it. Uh, but there, but one of the defining aspects of Emma Piano was the use of log drums. Of oh really? Okay, yeah, I didn't know that. Um, but yeah, there's a very typically Emma Piano albums are made by a producer, and the song will say their name, and then five five other people will be. Fe- they have a rotating cast of vocalists. Okay. And songs will typically be credited to five different people. Yeah. That's, I mean, I, when I was doing a, a couple of different episodes on very different music there, that happened in the, in the UK a lot in the, uh, you know, late eighties and through the nineties where you would have a production kind of collective that would like soul to soul was an example. And then they would have vocalists come in or different musicians come in and do their thing. And, and sometimes it would be under one name and sometimes you would see a list of like five different, you know, artists. And I find that really interesting and compelling for, with South African music, primarily because it means there's a whole hell of a lot going on there with a lot of artists and a lot of producing. Well, also, if you like a song that a singer is featured on, you, you can then look, look, look up their name and, and find more of their, their, their music. Um, yeah. I, I would say out of the music I included in that playlist, Citizen Deep's Arcade is my favorite album to come out of the the current South African scene. Okay. He's a producer. Arcade is supposed to be the first in a trilogy of albums. Arcade 2 
came came out around the end of last year. And Arcade 3 is supposed to be on the way at some point this year. Ooh, but that song, Mama Said That I Included, the vocals oh, yeah. could be are, are straight out of American R&B. Um, yes. but, but there's a real emphasis on, on vibes and mood and groove, a, a really long groove rather than something that, you know, to get, has to be three minutes to get radio play or these days, TikTok has made that even, even shorter. And South African music is actually going in the opposite direction of long songs, long out that kind of, uh, you know, that w- I can see them flung together at a dance club really, really nicely. Yeah. And to me, that's what it reminds me of because I, I had done this episode on progressive rock. And when I read a book about it, it was talking about how we don't realize how progressive rock influenced other forms of music that don't seem related at all. And one of them they mentioned was, was all the various forms of dance music, whether you're talking about a Donna Summer song that's slightly eight minutes long or anything from techno and house remixes, 12 inches especially, that the intention was to create this move, this vibe, this rhythm that people could continue to dance to whether it was a mellow one or a really energetic one or something in between. And that's what I'm a piano reminds me of. Uh, yeah, there's definitely a, um, it's interesting because Jacob is really a sibling scene and that has some, there, there have been some synthesis of the two genres, but even Shoma Josie and Babes Wadamo are kind of doing of the, the most successful version of Jacome that I've heard, mm. but even their music doesn't really have any melody to it. My, my Josie's John Cena is the one Jacome song that's come, come closest to being a hit in America. That, uh, that got her a U.S. deal with Sony. Oh, and okay. There's an Emma Piano song called Jeru, uh, Jerusalem, or Jerus- Jerusalem, by Master KG that that blew up on TikTok. Um, nice. It, um, but but currently the um, you know Afro beats. I I think South South African music is also starting to influence mu- music in Nigeria. There's a genre in Nigeria co- which is kind of a rougher version of Ama Piano. Ama Piano tends to be very. You, I don't mean this is a criticism, but you can hear it. You can picture it as background music in a restaurant. Right, it's right, very right. smooth. Yeah, you, you you could take it further into like almost smooth jazz. Um, yeah. So the, there, I know there's a form in Nigeria that's a bit that's a bit rougher. I, wow, well, I'd be interested in hearing that. I mean, I you know, there's certain kinds of that smooth music that I do enjoy, uh, and I and I'd like to explore on a piano a little bit more. But the Nigerian version sounds really compelling to me, you know. Now, I guess we're getting close to the end of our our time. And I I think the only comment that I would want to make is this is a perfect illustration of how you can pick any single country. And and A, you'll find it connected to so many other countries and styles of music historically and currently. But but B, even just even an hour or however long you want to earmark, is not enough to fully explore what is going on in just that single country. And my hope is that all of you out there and and us included are getting a bit of a primer as to what what is in South Africa, but also, and that you'll explore more. And that's why these playlists and things are here, but also that this will spur us to pick some other countries that deserve a spotlight and kind of dig into them too. Do you have any like closing thoughts or comments? Uh, well, certainly, like I said, Nigeria is kind of dominating com- uh, commercially in terms of African countries and the rest of the world. The Afrobeat scene there is really worth checking out, but also Afrobeat and Afrobeats sound nothing like each other. Where I I mm. came across and there's an Afrobeats compilation from about 2016 that I. I forget how I came across, 
and I was ex- I was expecting something that sounded like Fela Kuti, and it was all these artists who are now quite popular, like Wizkid and DeVito, and it was like it was obvious that they were trying to compete with with Drake and Rihanna and Beyonce hmm. nationally. It would it took me a while to adjust to that. I I think there is a tendency for Americans to value African music for to see it as being outside pop. Yeah. Where, which is not necessarily how the artists themselves what, 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 uh, uh, see themselves. Mm-mm. But um, yeah, there are a number of really interesting music scenes around uh, around Africa. I would all recommend checking out the Bandcamp page of the label Hakuna Kulala, which is based in Uganda. And for, for instance, they released an excellent album this year by the Kenyan rapper MC Yala. Okay. Um, but there's there are a couple of bands from the Democratic Republic of the Congo mm-hmm. who have gone to the junkyard to make their instruments huh. and work with, uh, you know, drumming on, build, building drums out of garbage cans yeah. and building, building ele- instruments that sound like electric guitars but are like, scraping there's a band called coco co who i think broke up that they had a video what called malembe which is pretty amazing the singer plays what sort of sounds like a guitar solo but he's actually scraping uh he's scraping a, a box of wood that has a contact mic and yeah. distortion pedal right under it oh. and their wow. drummer is also playing a kid partially made out of plastic water bottles oh. Wow, you can't get any more DIY than that. Yeah. No, it's like a of, jump of course, Poverty is a big part of the reason sure. why why you would uh you know not be able to afford to pay five hundred dollars for a guitar and you'd have to make or a drum set. Yeah. And you'd have to have to make your own instruments from yeah. the junkyard. No, that makes total sense. <laughs> Wow. See, and yeah, again, you're just bringing up things that that warrant their own, you know, discussion all, you know, all by themselves. Uh, thank you for spending this time with me. I I, I learned a lot. I hope everyone else did. Uh, and and I get, like I said, the main thing is I really want to listen to a lot more of this. Well, I, I hope that that your listeners enjoy the playlist and get introduced to, to some some of their new favorite artists and um, realize how approachable this, this music is, even if you don't necessarily understand the language that, that, that it's sung in. Yeah. Don't be afraid. You know, the, the things that were like, I think rightfully so we've been vilifying the word exotic lately because it distances us from other experiences and other cultures. And I think that we need to think of that because the, the music might sound slightly different to our ears or maybe very different. But if you listen more closely, you'll find a lot more commonalities. And I think that's a, I think that's a good place to leave it right now. Cause we're kind of running out of time, but uh, again, thanks Steve for spending this time with me. Sure, this was great. And everybody out there, uh, I'm going to put a link. Uh, I, I, I did inter- as you may know, I interviewed Steve a little while back of uh, the, you know, you should explore uh, Steve's music and writing as well. And definitely explore the playlists and and compilations that we've put here. And thank you for spending this time and watching and listening. And uh, as always, my objectives here are music, conversation, and connection. I will talk to you next week. 